I was 16 years old, I decided it was time to see the world. So I traveled from Denmark to California to join high school over there. Now I went there, I didn't go with any official program or any official organization. I essentially went there on my own. And so all alone, I had to dive into a pool of 3,000 students at Wilson High School in Long Beach, California. Now, I wasn't really equipped for this situation. This is what I looked like when I was 16 years old. And uh, I very soon got completely overwhelmed by extreme loneliness because I was all by myself among 3,000 people of whom I knew not one single one. And I soon deployed strategies so that I wouldn't look that lonely. I would ensure that I went off to, to classes very quickly so that I did, wouldn't have to wander the halls all by myself and all alone. And I'd get to class really early so that I could find a seat somewhere in the middle so that I wouldn't stick out and look as if I was by myself, but I would be surrounded by other people and no one would notice that I was just there by myself. And so recess was bad, but the absolute worst was lunch because lunch was a long break, and I had to fill that time all by myself. I had to scout out and try to find places that I could sit down and where I could eat my lunch and pull out time, let it drag out, so it seemed like I wasn't sitting there all by myself and really didn't have anyone to talk to. So I, of course, ended up eating lunch in a social hunch. And on the third day, magic struck. I'd signed up for a class, it was actually a drama class, and as usual, I got there quickly, sat down, and this time, another guy from, from class came in and, and sat down, he actually sat down next to me. And he said, are, are you new? And I said, uh, yeah, I, in fact I am, I'm, I'm actually new to the school. He said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Tony, hi, how do you do? And I said, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Lars, I'm from Denmark. Oh, wow, he said. Well, listen up, um, for lunch, would you wanna go out with me and my friends and grab a bite to eat? Well, as you can imagine, that was a huge turning point for me. For a 16-year-old that looks like this, that was amazing, because <laughs> it changed my day. And it didn't only change my day, it changed that year. And because of Tony, I had the experience of a lifetime. Suddenly, I had a friend. I was introduced to new acquaintances. I had people who would tell me stories, tell me jokes, and we could share experiences. It became the experience of a lifetime thanks to Tony. So Tony Lovett, Long Beach, California, thank you so much. I'm actually not in touch with him anymore, but this goes out to you. Thank you so much, Tony, you really saved me. And what I came to realize is, if you're ever in a situation where you feel lonely, cross your fingers and hope that you meet someone like Tony. Many years later, back in Denmark, I decided to embark on a personal project. I'm actually the son of an American father and a Danish mother. So I've grown up in a household where we spoke English, then Danish, then English, then Danish across the kitchen table. Quite normal in a bilingual family, but still something was at odds. I noticed something strange. What I noticed was that every time we switched languages, I would also switch personalities. Now, not in some, not Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde uh, kind of way, fortunately, but definitely I would, I would, I'm a different person when I speak English as compared to Danish. When I speak English, I'm just, I'm two notches happier than I am when I speak Danish. So I'm glad that I can speak English here, although it is, it is, is a little rusty. Um, and of course, I, I'm a little puzzled by that because as you might know, Denmark has been lauded as the happiest people on earth. And uh, of course, we must speak the happiest language on earth. But as I just said to you, I'm actually happier when I speak this other language, which in my case is English. That doesn't make sense. So I decided I, I need to figure out what's going on here. So I went out and I spoke to people who are way smarter than me, researchers, uh, universities, and trying to figure out what, what, what can be going on here. And after talking to several really, really smart people, the insights piled up and it was absolutely clear. What was at stake, what was happening is, it's fundamentally easier for me to be friendly towards other people when I speak English as compared to speaking Danish. And so this was a revelation to me because all of a sudden I can see, well, wait a minute. What's going on inside me and what's making me a little happier is actually when I forget myself and I start focusing on other people. And I'm better equipped for that when I speak another language than Danish. This is amazing. 
I need to delve way more into this, into this. I need to find more ways we can hack ourselves into more friendliness, because it obviously does a whole lot of good. And so I wrote a book, and uh, this, is, this is the book, and I should, ex I should excuse my language here. I know this is very coarse, especially in English. When you use the F word in Danish, it's to underscore your point, and that's what I was trying to do here, but I do know it's way coarse in, in English. And the second, the second word, flink, is Danish for friendly. So what I'm trying to say here is let's be effing friendly. Um, this book came out six years ago, and uh, I was actually going to go on to other projects. And I was a bit stunned because um, there were way more people than I had anticipated who were also out there trying to change things. And uh, in 2012, the Facebook page for effing flink became the fastest growing Facebook page in Denmark. And today, we can actually call ourselves the largest modern social movement in the nation. So that's pretty amazing. And we're now working, obviously, with 180,000 Danes. We're, work, we're working with municipalities. We're working with private as well as public organizations, trying to do things to further the connections between us, to mine all the good things that happen when we actually lean in towards each other and use each other and give to each other much more. Everything that we do is under the same purpose. It all serves this one purpose, which essentially is to take this country that, I'm, that I live in and that I love, which is Denmark, the happiest people, the happiest country in the world, and mobilize the people of this country into sharing their happiness with each other way more so that we're not merely the happiest people on Earth, but also the friendliest people on Earth. This is going to take a little time, but I'm going to work hard on it, and we're, we're now plenty of people working on it, so, so uh, we'll get going on it. Last winter, in February, my team and I uh, decided we need to know more about what actually happens when people are friendly towards each other, so we decided to uh, do an experiment, and we, uh, we, we, we called it the, the Danish friendliness experiment. Alongside with 981 Danes, we decided to carve out one week and for the duration of this week, we'd ask people to do one friendly deed a day for the duration of the week. And of course, we had to do, we had a treatment group and then we had a control group. So it was only the treatment group that we asked to do friendly things each day. The control group, we said, we'd like you guys to just behave as you'd normally do. Uh, don't be assholes. I mean, unless you normally are assholes. Uh, just behave as you would normally behave. And before we, we got going, we, we, we sent out a battery of questions on several different topics, ranging, on, ranging yeah, from, from uh, wellness to, uh, to, to mental well-being, or mental health. And um, when, the, when the week was over, we sent them the same questions and asked them to fill them out once again. And what we were looking for, obviously, was to see, is there a measurable change in us when we decide to act in a friendly manner? Now, you might be asking, well, what's a, what's, what is a friendly matter? What does, what does it mean to be acting in a friendly manner? And we actually asked participants. We, said, we told them, could you please tell us what did you end up doing as your friendly deeds? And one woman uh, wrote us, she said, well, actually, uh, one day I, I stepped into a supermarket, and in the supermarket I saw an elderly woman. She was trying to reach for a cart of yogurt, but she couldn't reach it. So I walked over, and I could reach it. I took it down from the top shelf, and I gave it to the elderly woman. That was that day's friendly deed for me. So it's that kind of thing. So what happens when we take down carts of yogurt for elderly women, or when we decide to be Tony? Pretty amazing things, actually. And what we found is the treatment group, the people who decided, to, or who were asked to do friendly deeds, after one week, they felt 38% less angry than the control group. Furthermore, they reported 29% less trouble getting out of bed in the morning. So they had quite a bit more energy, and they had substantially less anger. Now, we're all interested in new ideas, in innovation, so this is pretty interesting also, because what they also reported is they reported a 22% spike in feeling creative, which is obviously pretty important if you're trying to come up with new ideas. And when you're trying to work together and figure things out, it's also good to have a good time and being in a good mood. And what the treatment group told us is they reported that they laughed 16% more than the control group did. 
So as you can see, some pretty amazing results just from, from being friendly once a day for a week came out of this. And we were pretty, we were pretty jazzed by, uh, by the results of this. Mind you, in this experiment, we only measured what you did. So you were the friendly person. You, you were in the treatment group and you, did, you were doing friendly deeds. We did not measure what your friendly deeds did to me, the, the recipient of the, friendly, of the friendly deeds that you've done. International studies have actually shown that I will, but my, my spikes will be about the equivalent as yours. And what they've also shown is that people who observe what you're doing to me, the friendly deed that you're doing to me, just people who are seeing it, they're not even participating in it, they actually also get what f researchers call elevation. So they're also elevated by what you did. So good for you that you did it, because you're really spreading good. Alleviating other people's pain creates not just personal, but also societal gain. It's a good thing, keep it up, you're, you're doing good work. <laughs> and you could ask, why aren't we doing way more of this? I mean, why, aren't we, why don't we throw ourselves at each other and, and, and get going on, on being more friendly, cooking up a friendly revolution? Because it obviously does so much good for us. And I actually kind of asked that question because I'm a little puzzled. We should, we, should go, we should move faster. We should get going. Let's, let's, uh, let's, let's move ahead. Well, here's my take on things. I think we live in times that are puzzling, daunting, and totally exciting. But we have big issues out there that we're trying to solve. And so I think this is how, we, this is how we we're hunched over and we're working at them and we're really exciting and, and we hear something like this and we go, okay, that sounds, that sounds inter interesting, but I got, I've, got, I've got this really, really big problem here. I'm gonna try to solve it. So once I'm done with that, I'll get back to that. I kind of think we have this ass, ass, ass backwards. I think that we should really start over here because if we start over here with making, creating these connections and bettering these connections, we'd actually be way better at solving these complex problems that we're trying to solve. I totally believe in the old African proverb that goes something like this. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think that's what we're looking for. We're looking for solutions to complex problems we, we're looking to go far, and we're never going to get there if we go there alone. We need to go together, so we need to find good ways of going together. And that's what I think we can do if we team up with you. Nature shows us this, and we know this, that when we're alone and we don't have other people, we shrivel up. We do not, we, we don't thrive when we're left by, our, by, by ourselves to our own devices. We need each other. Nature shows us this. So we really should get going at it. This is where the F word comes in, because friendliness just doesn't have a whole lot of trendiness. No one wants to be just a nice guy. And you've got to give it a little oomph. You've got to give it a little pizzazz. And you've maybe got to give it the F word in order to get people alighted and to, to, uh, to actually listen and, and, and start doing something. Because we as people, are, we're set in our routines. We're set in our norms and we do things the way we're used to doing them. And in order to disrupt these norms, we need a jolt. We need to get a little push. <laughs> and that push, that could be the F word. That could be giving it a little umph. And that's why I love examples of people who have taken friendliness or making connection be between people and taking it just one step further. Like George from San Francisco, who took a drone and then he outfitted the drone with mistletoe. And then he took this drone and he flew it over Union Square in San Francisco for the holiday season. And of course, we all know what you do when, you're under, when you find yourself under a mistletoe. Well, when people, strangers, were walking, walking along uh, on Union Square, all of a sudden they were in a new situation because here we are, there's a mistletoe there, oh, whoa. Uh, <laughs> and, the, and it was moving along. Obviously, pretty awkward situations ensued but also pretty magical situations ensued, new situations. So it's a social hack with a whole lot of urban poetry that I just love. Now, let's, if we move to another uh, intelligent solution, uh, Fra Biancoshock from Italy, um, he took two insights. He took one insight, and that is that we all, regardless of age, love to pop bubble wrap. <laughs> and he took another insight, and that is we hate to wait for the bus. And he fused these two insights into an amazing idea, giving us anti-stress for free. He had cut out pieces of bubble wrap, so if you had a three-minute wait, five-minute wait, or 10-minute wait, you could sit there 
at the bus stop together, you could sit at the bus stop and pop. That's amazing. And there's an uh, everyday ingenuity like this. I found uh, one of our members uh, from, from the, the Flink uh, movement sent this in from a doctor's office in, uh, in Denmark. It's a simple solution, but it's a great solution. Uh, in, the doctor, in the waiting room of the doctor's office, this is what you could find. There's this here, and then up here, a little note that says, feel free to knit, and knit as much as you'd like. Once the scarf is done, it'll be given to a homeless. Well, that's just a warming and heartwarming idea, and I just love it. David Bowie, uh, in his song, Heroes, famously said, we could be heroes just for one day. And I don't know, that song just, it always infused in me uh, a belief. I just, that's true, we can. I'm idealistic, I'm totally blue-eyed idealistic, so I believe stuff like that. And I do believe that we can be heroes. And I actually believe that if we decide to do what you did, if we decide to be effing flink towards each other, we can actually be more than heroes every day. We can be everyday artists, every day. But now we're maybe not all artists. I for sure am not an artist. I don't know how to play the guitar. I don't know how to paint. How many among you would say, no, I don't really feel that I'm, I'm artistic? Just, I, I wouldn't, because I, I, I don't know how to uh, play the guitar. I don't know. Yeah, quite a few of us. Yeah, we're not artists. No, we, we, we can't do it. Well, here's my take on it. Of course we can. We, if, we just, if we decide that the canvas that we're to paint on is the space between us, then all of a sudden that turns us into potential everyday artists. And then sure, okay, you might say, well, no, but I, 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 I don't know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a business person. I, don't, I don't, don't get ideas like putting mistletoe on a drone. I, I totally agree with you, neither do I, but we've got to remember, as every artist will say to us, Mona Lisa was not painted in one day. And as every artist also will say, you've got to practice one stroke, by, uh, one stroke at a time. And you do it, and you do it, and you do it again. Steve Jobs said, real artists ship. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to ship, and we need to ship every day. We need to turn ourselves into being everyday artists every day. But how is it we do this? It's really, really simple, actually. We're going to find ourselves in situations like this. We're going to have a helping hand where people will tell us, now try to do this. Other times, we'll be in situations where we won't know how to get to know each other or make the connections with other people. So promise me this, and this is the ask that I'd like to make to you guys. Whenever you're in a situation like that, where you're in a, in a group of people, or you're among other people, and you see one person and you think there might be the slightest chance that that person could feel just a little bit lonely, be Tony. Because <laughs> after all, we can all be Tony just for one day. Thank you very much.